Okay, so there's all your Yeah, okay. We'll just swap. Hi, live stream. We'll be getting started in just a second. Uh, hey, welcome to the Open Government Hack Night. Uh, I could have sworn only like 20 people are as There's more than 20. But hey, that's a good thing. So, uh, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Chicago's place to learn about open government, open data, civic technology, uh, and kind of work on stuff, but also uh, uh, learn and, and, uh, and meet sort of the community of people who've been doing this for. I guess we've been doing this for two years now. Uh, so I'm Derek Eater. I'm one of the organizers, and along with Christopher Whitaker and Juan Pablo Velez and Spitza. Uh, and uh, we kind of run a, a sort of a, a loose agenda here. Um, so in the beginning, uh, because uh, uh, everybody in this room is awesome just because you're here, uh, it's good for us to all know each other. So uh, we just like to go around the room and just do a quick uh, introduction. What's your name? We want to ask a, a question this time. Your favorite animal. animal. No, something productive. <laughs> 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 one subject you care about most. In this, what is the one? One subject you care about. Ah, okay, yeah. So name a, something you care about in the city. So it could be a policy. It could be uh, could be data set. You know, it's up there. But uh, something about Chicago that you're you're very interested. In. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I'll start. Uh, like I said, I'm Derek Eater. I'm a uh, open data web developer. I I guess right now I'm thinking about snow farms. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christopher Whitaker. I am a consultant with the Smart Chicago Collaborative and the Code for America Brigade Captain for Chicago. And my big thing is uh, technology tools used by government employees. Uh, I'm with I'm one of the organizers. Uh, and I care about um, bus rapid transit and not letting those fucking Nimbies over there. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, my name is Matthew Thomas. I'm a research consultant and I'm concerned more about uh, transportation security in Chicago. Uh, I'm Nat Zorak and I'm uh, mostly concerned with uh, the impending financial disaster in Chicago and how we can figure out a way to solve the <coughs> Budget deficits and be productive. Um, my name is Renee, and uh, I'm here observing. I care about uh, getting the word out on some of these apps a little bit better with uh, some translation. So I'm learning uh, both uh, coding and translation. Uh, my name is Daniel Ronan, and I like historic preservation and economic development. Uh, my name is Stephen Vance. I'm a transportation reporter for Streets Blog Chicago. And I like bikes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Sean Jacobson, and I guess I'm just interested in the city's complete streets policy. I'm Rob Carroll. I'm a consultant. Uh, neighborhood demography. Kyle Schaefer at Most Upper Fabian City Employee Seas Youth. Um, I'm Lynn. I teach math in a high school, so I guess professionally, education is like my Rama. Personally, I like biking. Uh, cheers, I'm Daniel. I'm with the Experimental Station. We're working on healthy food access advocacy, which is also what I care most about in the city, so it's cool. I'm Kathy. I'm a consultant. And what I care about most is, um, I guess, data in the city, but not just data, like the narratives within data and the context outside data. I'm Alex Castellanos. I'm a public affairs consultant for a company called Purple Strategies here in town. And we're, um, I'm, I'm personally interested in economic development, community development. Steve Ediger. Um, I'm interested in uh, individual and community empowerment. Uh, my name is Arad Yeah. Uh, I design games and user experiences for um, education um, at Freedom Games. and. The thing I'm excited about the most in the city of Chicago is education equity through community and technology cross pollination. Um, my name is Casey. I work in insurance. I'm kind of new to this, um, but I'm here to learn a lot. And last time I was here for um, 
Tracy Schwartz is talking violent crime, so they got me pretty beat up. So, um, <clears throat> my new subject of choice. I'm Kurt Rudolph. Uh, I'm a software developer at Exchange. Uh, I care about software and community development. I'm Beth. I'm in education, and I care about spreading the make culture in the city. I like biking. Uh, I'm Bart. I'm a Hauser, um, and I don't know much about technology. Uh, I'm going there, and I'm a statistician, and I like to see if I can have anything to use my statistical knowledge to utilize. Uh, I'm Scott Bezla. Uh, I'm a software developer. Um, Relapsed environmental engineer. Uh, so I'm interested in uh, environmental issues, environmental justice, uh, water issues. I'm Nick Bennett. I'm a developer. Um, I'd say the resource in Chicago, Chicago I'm most interested in is sort of in this room. People who are interested in getting into programming or uh, want to find out projects to work on, and I really want to help you do that. Uh, my name is Ross Hutzel. I'm a product manager at Business Express. <coughs> financial broker firm. I like that as part of our swag. Uh, and we're kind of interested in funding a lot of these ideas and figuring out a better way to bring the money to the actual. My name is Eugene. Um, working in finance. Um, I guess it's been said. And it's mostly just in education and Western education. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I like the, the intersections of data sets. So the, the fuzzy gray areas in between two data sets are the interesting things. Okay. Hey, all, my name is Ruben. I'm a developer. Uh, currently interested uh, in transit and also. You know, giving the civic information that's you know most important to you as quickly as possible. I'm Linda. I do business strategy. Things I'm interested in in the city are uh, recycling, access recycling, and, and water. My name is Boyan. I work for Polar US. Personally and professionally, I care deeply about immigration, particularly the rights of undocumented and their access to education. Terry Enright. I'm interested in equitable housing for everyone. Hi, my name is Juan Carla, and I'm an Italian student, and I'm interested in transparency and the public administration. I'm Stefania, I'm an Italian student too, and I'm interested in how internet can help tourists. Uh, my name is Jana Fremark, I'm a city planner. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to understand more about the elasticities of sales with regards to changing taxes. <coughs> My name is Valentina, and I'm an um, information technology professional. And I'm interested in uh, healthcare data sets and how they can help um, healthcare disparities. Uh, my name is Megan Sullivan. I'm a quality assurance engineer. Um, the thing that keeps me up at night is affordable housing and eradicating. I'm Jeff Judge. I'm an entrepreneur. I run a company called Signal, and um, uh, I really care about protected bicycling structure and, and education. Really just making the city better. Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> my name is Tom Shank. I'm the director of analytics for the city of Chicago. I run the city's data enterprise, such as the uh, data portal, the advanced analytics we do, the databases that we have. He's usually you accurately shaved, so it's <laughs> long hours. This is Tom Shake after hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a pay stop. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Uh, I think we have yeah. okay. um, Hello, everybody. My name is Kayla. I just recently graduated from school uh, to get a degree in design. Um, so I'm here because I'm very interested in learning more about programming, and I'm very passionate about education and um, getting high school students more civically engaged. Um, I'm Nina. I, um, I've always been interested in data. My husband is fourth generation Chicago, so I love the city. 
um, I'm interested in <laughs> economic development, but the thing that I'm working on right now is uh, getting people enrolled and helping organizations get people enrolled under the Affordable Care Act. So before we go on to the next section, I want to have a footnote to my earlier inflammatory comment about anti-DRC people. Uh, you're also welcome. I didn't mean that to sound like you know, aggressive, because everyone is wrong about something sometimes. So <laughs> you're welcome here too. So now we do a round of announcements where if you've got a project coming up or something you saw that's interesting and relevant that you want to throw up there, uh, we have a, an open floor. Events also. Events. Any announcements? Anyone can skip right in. Oh wait, yes. <laughs> Third and final time. Uh, next week is a Divi bike share data focused half night here. Uh, representatives from Divi and from CDOT will be here. Uh, and there will be a special announcement. Um, and if you show up early, you will also receive a prize of some kind. <laughs> 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 Uh, cool. Any other announcements? I have one. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right. Uh, for those of you who have seen this a million times, I apologize. If you go to clearstreets.com. Dot org. Well, I think I've got both, but yeah. Dot biz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not biz. Actually, you could probably buy clear dot streets today. Yeah, yeah. Dot streets. Has everyone heard about this? The internet just got super weird. They're, they're starting to, you know, it's always been dot com, dot org. Right. From now on, it can be like dot whatever, you can pay lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the way it works is people, not you and me, because we're not millionaires, but companies can opt, can lobby for you know, basically organization that makes domains happen. Domains are the things after the period. Uh, and if they pay them enough money, around a million dollars, then they get exclusive rights to sell any website under that dot, whatever. So it's dot Chicago. If Chicago, this would be a Really a revenue player. Are you thinking about this, Tom? <laughs> buy that, scare up the money, buy that Chicago, and then you will like literally print money for the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, because then you can, can you show, elaborate on this? They like <laughs> <laughs> I, if you guys were to give me some money, no, we're not talking about Dash Chicago. I'm Dash Chicago, I'm Dash Chicago together, and then anyone who wants a domain, a Dash Chicago domain, would have to buy it from us, and we get all the money. Because Chicago is great, we make tons of money. So, uh, <laughs> we'll if anyone wants to session. work on this idea, I'll <laughs> yeah. uh, this is uh, something that's been up for a while. It's uh, but it's topical. So for, for those who haven't seen it before, um, it's a way of seeing West Street uh, <coughs> cloud, and it's something we built on top of a service that the city provides called Cloud Tracker. So Cloud Tracker. You're going to go to Star Trek or up? Uh, I'm not sure if they've ordered the, some, There's some files out there, but I'm not sure if they've ordered them yet. So when it snows, stuff gets cloud. And when stuff gets cloud, the, the trucks have GPS on them, and they're actually broadcasting their location. And the seed puts it up on a map called Plot Tracker, which uh, is, will be live in a couple of hours. We take that same information of where clouds are kind of in real time, and we turn cloud location points into uh, streets. So we can kind of say, this street was cloud at this time. The, the, the name of the application is a tiny bit of an oversell. We don't actually know if stuff is clear because it's snowing a lot. <laughs> City appreciates your optimism. But it's, so it should be like probably cloudstreets.org. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's useful to see kind of what's your neighborhood looking like. Did the, did the clouds hit the, um, your area overnight? If you go to animation, then your browser will probably slow down. Oh, Parker, you're driving. <coughs> Sorry, it's Tweety. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the last storm. You're about to see a bunch of little points of all the clouds that were out at a certain time, and they kind of start where they were, where they were at a different time. We should probably make this a bit faster. I have to optimize the image. But uh, if you have a really fast computer, well, well, I'm also live streaming, so. Like Pac-Man. So what's going on is that the plows are. Yeah, black dot represents a plow observation. It's a plow saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. And what you see is that the big arterial streets, the, the grid could fill them first, and then in a little bit they're about to go into the side streets. That's why your block usually takes longer than a. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. So every time it snows, they do this. There's about three big pyramid plows the city has, uh, and well, they don't always finish all of them, but uh, when a big storm, they'll do all of them. Uh, and yeah, they'll plow. And uh, I think the city's almost out of its plow budget at this point. Three quarters. <laughs> three quarters of the way. See, now they're starting to hit the side cheese there. Does that mean it's going to stop snowing pretty soon? Yeah, that's how that works. Therefore, because of, yeah, it's a very long phrase. What does he say to do when I'm telling you? I keep plowing through it. You find money elsewhere. You spend less money than you spend on something. Cool. Any other announcements before we get on to our presentation? Cool. All right, Juan, you want to sit this one? Ah, yes. <laughs> Our last year's speaker. Who here has heard of Fundrise? Fundrise? Because I told you guys about it. Yeah. Because you're a huge nerd. Um, <laughs> so Fundrise is uh, basically Kickstarter for real estate. And what this means is um, you generally to invest in real estate, the way you do it is you're a white collar person and you have a retirement account, and then someone at a bank says, we're going to stick your retirement money into the widget, factories that make widgets, and into glass boxes somewhere. And uh, Or you're incredibly, incredibly wealthy. You're definitely like 1% level, in which case you can be an accredited investor, which means you can put your millions into more glass boxes. What hasn't really been doable until now is for you to say, hey, I'm interested in taking that abandoned building around the corner and putting you know, whatever you think is awesome. Uh, Involve bar. <laughs> uh, but I need to raise capital in order to renovate it because it's been banned for a while. So uh, I'm asking you for money, not in the Kickstarter vein of give me money, please, and some money will do it, I don't understand. Um, but in the way of like, give me money and I'll give you equity. So it's a real, real loan, it's a real mortgage sort of thing. Um, and you can put in as little as five bucks. Is there a loan? I can do that, hundred bucks. Hundred bucks, okay. So you've got hundred bucks lying around? you can stick it into local real estate. And so the ambition is to make um, local neighborhood development much more uh, grassroots, but in an actual real way, where people are putting skin in the game. And um, if you are a fan of cities, you might know that building up cities is really difficult because people hate change. And when you want to build something tall, they'll say, but there's not enough parking here already. And those people are the ones who go to the community meetings and crush the project. <laughs> but here, there's a way that you can show passively your support because you're, you're actually very well supporting it. So <clears throat> I found out about this a while ago. It started in DC and it's trying to take off. I logged on to this thing, and I looked to, for Chicago. And the first thing I saw, to my complete surprise, because if you look at this ad, it all looks very like, <laughs> but the first thing I see is, is this thing called the hand built city. And the hand built city is about uh, creating um, affordable housing in Gary and St. Louis. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about my website. It's, it's, it's so bad. It's minimalistic. <laughs> the work's more important. Um, and so I was like, what is this? And I instantly stopped them on Twitter and um, eventually lured them here with pizza. And so uh, they're going to talk about uh, less about Fundrise and more about the work that the Anvil City does uh, in the rest of Cool. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I can I can for you. Sweet. That's set up right now. So, nice to call you. Okay. so um, yeah, my name is Nat Zorek. Um, uh, I am basically most of the handbuilt city these days. I uh, worked with a few partners in Indiana, a few partners in St. Louis. And so um, my interest in real estate, my interest in uh, well, being a civic minded person in Chicago is basically uh, coming from having come at this from a sort of bizarre direction. I didn't get an MBA, I studied art history in college, and basically got out of college and figured. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm now in St. Louis, and i got to figure out what I'm, what I'm doing in St. Louis, and there are a lot of these abandoned buildings that are hanging out, and so uh, what are we going to do to solve that issue? So I, I started, um, I, I've, I've had a long-standing appreciation for the worlds of finance and, uh, you know, urban development, architecture, all these things. So I wanted to think about a way that I could get involved in sort of addressing the issues of, of the 
uh, capital deficits in these neighborhoods that are really struggling and cities that are really struggling, and also addressing the issues of the actual like architectural process of renovating houses. Um, so this is called, you cannot see the rest of it, but it's called I think Shopping. I broke your computer. It's OK. It's <laughs> yeah. I don't really do computers. <laughs> Can I hit the button? Oh, is it frozen? I think so. I'll plug it. Yeah, that is mine. That's why I never use my computer. I don't know about it. I don't know. Yes, you do. Don't worry. You can hold it up and I don't know if you can look at it. I'm going to wait until it unfreezes. You can email it to Chris and then Chris can clear it up. I know to do that to you and to Derek. Oh, great. Either way. So yeah, the idea was um yeah, yeah so the presentation is called shuffling the deck yeah. because the idea is you know like think about your deck in financial terms of uh, you know, your, your, your stock orders that are coming in and the idea is that you're um you know for this the idea of the fundrise is that it's basically this sort of disruptive process it's this idea of disruptive innovation and um, the whole thing is figuring out how to do something with all these great technological systems that we have going. Um, so, basically, my role, um, I have worked as a consultant in Indiana um, doing housing development for a partnership, a big private equity partnership that basically buys up houses and works to address the issue of tax foreclosure and expropriation. Um, it's sort of a weird world because it's this bizarre intersection of the informal and the formal. Uh, it's very much like sort of orthodox finance guys who are involved in it, but the way they approach the issue is which is building this sort of building this system that's really um, it's really intriguing because it's it sort of capitalizes on all these weird things that are going on. This process of tax foreclosure, which has the potential to be very unequitable and unfair. Can you but explain what tax foreclosure? Tax foreclosure is like so that there's bank foreclosure, which is where you don't pay your mortgage, and tax foreclosure is similar to that, but in a bank foreclosure, the bank is basically trying to recoup its losses and avoid losing all the money that they lent for this project, uh, which in Gary, Indiana, is a huge problem because they were selling houses 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008 for like 60 and 70 thousand dollars that are now selling at tax foreclosure sales for like 300 dollars, and so you can you can imagine that it's sort of a it's sort of a messed up um, like the way the the way the system has has evolved. Um, tax foreclosure is basically you don't pay your taxes and then your, your house gets sold at you know, sheriff sale or they, they have commissioner sales. They're called. Um, so basically, changing gears for one for one moment. Um, what what is fundrise? So we, we heard about um, from Juan what fundrise is, and basically the uh, how I had gotten connected with them is that I was working on this project as part of the handbuilt city, which ended up just sort of being a pilot. For, like, can we do this? And I was thinking, well. I'm not going to get a bank to lend me a quarter million dollars um, because basically uh, my experience with bankers has basically been that uh, you go in and you say, here's a proposal, here are all my, my tax returns for the past you know, 50,000 years, uh, here's you know, my mother's maiden name, you know, and, and you give them all this information and you say, well, that's, that's very interesting and I, I, I really like your project, it sounds really great, we'd love to lend in these inner city neighborhoods and I, just, I need more information. And over the course of doing urban development work, um, I've learned that I need more information. It's usually slang for, please get the hell out of my office. <laughs> so um, I, I started thinking about this. I was thinking, well, certainly, if I can't get, can we get the lights on? If I can't get uh, a quarter million dollars from, from one institution, I can probably get $1,000 for 250 people. Um, Let me know if I should move forward on this one. Yeah, you can actually you can move forward now. And so the idea is basically, this idea, you know, it's a whole idea of crowdfunding. If you if you get if you go back in time and watch these cycles of sort of what I call um no back one sorry okay this guy yeah um I, I call them cycles of capital innovation, which is basically like every couple of decades something gets massively reorganized in the way we think about financial markets. It's like whether it's mergers and acquisitions or leverage buyouts and all these things. Um, you know, like Richard Gere and Pretty Woman. You know, like am I, am I that? Am I too old? Um, so, <laughs> great film. But the idea is that he's basically like capitalizing on this 1980s trend of like borrowing large amounts of money and then buying these companies and selling them off. And somehow that's a job. Um, so, in this case, crowdfunding. Uh, Fundrise, uh, Ben and Dan Miller were basically like, okay, we have this uh, real estate development firm 
And we're tired of working with these private equity investors because if you've ever worked with big money private equity investors, they're it can be difficult to work with. Uh, so, so they basically said, well, we probably have enough sort of social affinity, social capital between all the people we work with, that we're going to figure out this way to get set up to crowdfund, crowdsource the, the investment process. And how that looks in, in like very technical terms is that they basically went to the SEC and said, hey, we like this Regulation A offering. We want to figure out a way that we can get unaccredited investors to invest money in our projects. Uh, the process of actually filing for a Regulation A offering is like, uh, it's like it takes like weeks and weeks of people who like go to school for this stuff, and so it's not very easy to do. Um, but it's, it's a legal vehicle through which you can accept money from regular people as opposed to from, uh, yeah, well, typically it's not regular people is the problem. Um, and a lot of the crowdfunding stuff that's happening now, like we talk about the Jobs Act and all this stuff, and people say that's a just huge step forward for um, for for investment and finance. But it's really a matter of basically getting accredited investors to invest larger amounts of money. So it's not really crowdfunding, it's just sort of a reorganization of the stock market. And in this case, we're not using accredited investors. We're using everyone in this room, for example. Um, the idea is, you can advance one more. Um, so, so the idea is that we're, we're taking these, uh, we're taking just relationships that we have with individuals and using those as sort of the starting points for capital. Um, my interest in thinking about this was also the fact that I worked in this private equity world with guys who would basically say, hey, Mark, I got a good deal for you. Can you cut me a check for $350,000? I'll pick it up tomorrow. And then, like, the sort of implications that that has for, for how people think about, like, things like risk assessment. Um, instead of having your risk all in one place from that one person who's going to, like, seriously come to your house and break kneecaps if you don't pay this money, you know, you're spreading out the risk over, over a larger pool of people. And so where this comes <coughs> into the context of uh, urban, urban development, we're thinking about, you know, we think about tech, and we think about what tech can do for our cities. And I came up here from St. Louis, where they have this idea of, like, a, a tech startup on every corner. And it's this idea of, like, we can dump all this investment money into these corporations or these small companies and startups <coughs> that are then going to make apps, and they're going to change the world. But a lot of times what this amounts to is what I call this like one-way street of capital, which is um, sort of the idea that we're, we're creating, creating platforms like Kickstarter. They're really great at funding small projects, but the problem with them is that they're funding small projects and siphoning off a massive amount of capital over the course of doing so. Um, and you know this comes from how we think about seed funding, venture capital, all this stuff. Where basically Kickstarter was basically started in 2009, I think, for like something like 10 million dollars in seed funding. And so they have to make that 10 million dollars back, and then they have to make an additional 10 or 20 million dollars on top of that. So they're saying we're going to basically siphon off something like 10 or 12 percent from every transaction when we include processing fees and all this stuff. So Fundrise is, is is a lot simpler because going directly from a bank account transaction, taking money out of your bank account, they're using Something like one to three percent from every transaction. And this is because they've simplified the regulatory process. Um, then the question becomes, how do you convince people that this is different from Kickstarter? You're not donating ten dollars to help someone record an album. You're investing hundreds or thousands of dollars to rebuild a neighborhood. Um, you can advance more. Um, basically, I mentioned this whole thing about the three hundred thousand dollars versus the. 301, this is my great graphic design skills at work. Um, so, so the, you know, there are a lot of problems with this. The idea of risk mitigation, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of Fundrise, or there was originally, because people said, like, well, you know, like the sort of orthodox investment uh, professionals basically were like, well, you can't invest your money in this because it's going to go from very liquid to very illiquid. Which basically means that if you think about product, you know, you have cash in your pocket right now, you could go to 7-Eleven, you could buy a monthly membership at 1871, or you could buy a house. Um, if you go to 7-Eleven and you buy like shaving cream, Coke, whatever, like you can use those products. But if you buy a house, you know, but if you're not living in that product or living in that house or using that product, the point is that it, you, you can't just take that house and then just like hand it over to somebody else. Um, so that's that's the idea of liquidity, like what you can use it, use money or capital for. Um, <laughs> The idea here is that by decentralizing this process of investment, you're achieving, you know, let's say, clouds and clouds. 
Um, the cloud is the idea if you drop your iPhone in the toilet, it's OK, because all your data is going to be backed up on the internet. Um, in this case, it's basically, I see it the same way. It's like saying you're spreading out your, you're spreading out your risk, you're spreading out all your, your capital, and therefore social capital, over all the, this big network of people. Um, play nicely with others. I, I had a conversation with a guy this morning who's interested in figuring out a way to connect with, connect Fundrise with some Chicago CBCs and basically, uh, basically his idea that was saying we could expedite the terrible permitting processes for building new construction and doing development in the city of Chicago by saying, look, we've got this block on board with it, so like we have to do it now, as opposed to saying, well, you got to go through these like months and months of meetings and then you're still not going to get your permit. Um, you can go the next one. So I've sort of jumped around a little bit, but um, the idea here, we have 122 members in our network right now, which uh, does not sound like a whole lot of people until you realize this is the largest one in the Midwest. Um, and basically, I've been doing the crowdfunded thing for a minute. I have a very simple, like I mentioned, this pilot project. And the idea of Fundrise is that we're trying to figure out a way to use it as a vehicle for education, uh, for collaboration, for connecting with people who would not necessarily be involved in the process otherwise. Um, I have made so many bizarre connections through bizarre channels that I would not have made if I were just using if I were just using bank financing, which, by the way, I can't even get because it's in Gary and Canada, and people hear Gary and they say, well, I drove through there one time and it smelled really bad, so I'm not going to invest money. Um, so this is sort of about, you know, it's about, it's about collaboration, it's about sharing, it's about, it's about education, it's about challenging perceptions of uh, distressed inner cities. And it's about building affinity for what these cities can become and what we can do. Um, you can go one more. So this is the network as of, I guess, yesterday. Um, see, people are repping St. Louis pretty hard. And um, it basically just shows where all of our people are from. And I can't even tell you like how much this is actually in terms of committed financing. Because we have, you know, there's a process of putting together an offering. We have an asset base, we have real estate, we have cash, but the problem is that we don't, you know, we haven't put together an offering yet. So it's, it's, to translate, you've got a bunch of buildings you've already bought for like $500 or whatever. Pretty much. From the county, to the Gary, I can't pay my mortgage, or I can't, and actually, I can't pay my taxes, and actually, the county takes it over. There's an auction where you can buy these things for dirt cheap. You've done that. So you've got. Mostly abandoned buildings, I'd say. So you've got abandoned buildings that you've owned. And some occupied ones. And some occupied. How many abandoned buildings do you own? People ask me that a lot. I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, I jointly own a couple with the partnership I work for, and then Handled City owns its own as well. So it's basically like, to give you an idea of the prices involved, we basically bought nine acres of land that is surrounded by the National Lakeshore for something like $21,000. Um, nine acres. So that's, that's it's something like we're looking at doing several rehabs in the next six months, probably like three or four. Um, nine acres of empty land or with buildings on Nine acres of empty land, nice. I'd say. Um, and basically, one of the ideas we're thinking about is how to connect with local entrepreneurs who are doing all this stuff because it's really, um, you know, there's the, the point here is really just try and strike a balance between how traditional finance operates in inner city development, which is basically saying we can't get this project done unless we use $150 million of federal financing to do it. And it's like, well, that's cool, but that's not really benefiting anyone because you made these really pretty buildings. But people are still poor, and so it's like, if you want to actually like locate yourself in this community and work with the community, this is the idea of Fundrise. You're using your local social capital to leverage investment capital from elsewhere. Um, I see a lot of opportunities for connecting with the open data universe because uh, basically there's a huge information deficit between people who like want to connect with these capital systems, people who want to connect with other developers, people who want to connect with investment opportunities. And you know, it's, it's sort of like a matter of saying, like, how do we figure out who owns these buildings in the first place? Like The process of inner city development and urban decline in general is that uh, there's this huge problem with uh, like the legal complexity of uh, 
managing the disposal and liquidation of these units that are distressed. Um, Can you talk to Bridget Hayner? If not, then you should definitely connect with her. It's the Land Bank in Chicago. They basically settled with all the banks before the banks <coughs> settled with everybody else. So instead of down hard, got 30 million. And all of that, or even more, and all of that is that you know, for exactly what you're talking about. Abandoned buildings that have title issues, and the city is bringing all those up, and then trying to find property. This is a Cook County land Yeah, it's countywide. Sure. So, what, what happens with these places is um, if I were to just walk away from my building and, and not come back, the only way that the county, the local government, knows that I exist is they have my mailing address. And if they mail me shit and I don't respond, I'm effectively off the grid, in which case, can they take it over and buy it? Technically, no, because we have property rights in this country, right? <laughs> but that means that you've got places where, beyond the fact that the neighborhood is in rough shape, and that demand for uh, <laughs> demand for housing is, is really low, you've got people who want to buy properties who can't because they don't know, like, nobody knows who owns them. Literally, it's called unclear titles. You can't figure out who owns them. Or people owe, you know, hundred thousand dollars in taxes they never paid to the, to the county, and that place is probably worth twenty thousand dollars. So who's going to buy that? Right? So, so what the county land bank does is it, take, it can take over properties, remove those kinds of legal issues, and basically prep these things to be sold and redeveloped by people like him. And I should say also the the sort of uh, corollary to that whole thing is saying. Um, one of the weirdest things about this whole process is that all the debt that gets associated with a title, so you own a property and your house is represented by a title, which is a legal document. This, this, we've progressed now into the feudal era of, of how we think about things. It's like the era of thieves and vassal lords and stuff. So when you don't pay your mortgage or your credit card bill or your medical payments or whatever, you get this, this debt gets converted into a lien. And so this comes in so many different kinds of liens and there's subordinated liens and all sorts of kinds of liens. Um, but the process of buying them at a tax sale is similar to what you're saying with the land bank, where basically this debt gets erased. It's kind of like magic. Um, which is weird because at some level this debt is all kind of theoretical. I think when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's never going to get paid off. But the cool thing about it is that in many cases we've worked with homeowners who are going to get kicked out of their houses and we'll say, we're not going to kick you out of your house. We'll just negotiate a monthly rental rate, pay off the debt. Oh, the debt of us purchasing it, I should say, not the debt that is now erased, essentially, because all the liens are gone. A little more complicated than that, but that's the simplest way to explain it. And a lien is like an IOU. So you didn't pay the county your taxes for the last three years. You still owe them that by law, and that gets turned into a piece of paper that says you owe us this stuff. It's called a lien, and it moves with the property unless, unless the county absolves you legally of that. And so what, he, and what happens when uh, a lot of places... Counties just sit on these properties, and they don't have anyone whose job it is to try to sell them. So these things just sit there for decades. In in a lot of new nowadays, you do what's called a tax sale, which is you literally sell people's debt. You say, hey, you technically owe us that, but I can buy that debt. But I'll pay you hundred thousand dollars for that debt, and I can go and collect. It's basically legalized loan sharking, is what it is. Um, it's all. I mean, it's also the fact that I mean, in this in this case, you're buying the whole tax lien, which you know, like at a Theoretical level, like we're good Americans, so we love the idea of government being sort of the powerful thing, which is why the, the, the property tax liens are like the superior liens of all liens. So you might have $200,000 of debt in your house, but if you don't pay $2,000 in taxes, your house is gone, and the bank probably is not going to claim that back, even though they have the right to. So it's a weird, it's a really weird world. Um, I've, I've done a lot of the legal work for it. And it's sort of like really harrowing to see how much, you know, you have these people, you read through these mortgage documents and you realize that some bank was selling these poor people like mortgages that were like 45 times the value of their house at 12% interest and stuff like that. Um, but what I'm looking to do is figure out, like, let's make, let's form partnerships, let's figure out, you know, projects, like ways we can deploy this model. And ways to connect it. Honestly, Fundrise is not backed by you know sort of Series A multi-million dollar financing from venture capitalists because it's basically basically started sort of like a pet project that turned into something bigger. So a lot of things that are present in startup venture capital world, you know, like like really cool features. Um, there are no apps for Fundrise. There are a lot of cool things that could be done with it. 
Um, so you can just go to the last slide, which is basically saying, uh, hopefully I've convinced everyone that this is a really awesome idea, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. And that's this, these links will take you to our to our page if you are so inclined. So, any questions for yeah? Sure. Yeah. When you go to the site, can you like walk us through what's what any of us might do if we wanted to invest? So basically, you go to this link. Guy, this is not a real link. Why? <laughs> <laughs> wasn't mine. It's a uh, one lowercase. Oh no. Fundride.se. Basically, oh, and then um, one lowercase a. See. Oh. Done. Uh, one lowercase a, capital T, lowercase t, capital K D I. This is the sort of general general link, and basically what you do is you can log in. I hope you're on Facebook. You can log in <laughs> with, a, with a social network like LinkedIn or Facebook. And you basically say, like, what are my investment objectives? Um, you basically have to answer questions as though you're going to invest, but you don't actually have to invest. And so a lot of people have said, well, I'm not going to join because I don't have any money. And it's like, well, it's, it's not really the point. The point is that we're using the vehicle for, for outreach and for building sort of affinity for the model. And, so yeah, we know a lot of ways it can happen. Basically, basically you can join without having the commitment of doing much with it. What will happen is we have to we put together an investment offering, and then they approve it. Or who's the they? Uh, the fundraising management team. Who's that? Um, it's like they have about a dozen people who do. I mean, they're like real estate investment professionals. In DC. In DC, yeah. So, do you work for fundraise? I do. I do not actually. I work. I mean, I well. <laughs> No, I do not. <laughs> I work with Fundrise. So. That, that capital investment, it's only real estate. Does it go to the operator? No, it's, it's, uh, hmm. it's all for real estate. Yeah, it's all for real estate. But one, the one thing I'd say to that is that a lot of times, depending on who's doing the project, you're going to have cost mm -hmm. structures that are a little bit different based on whether you're investing in like a developer or like a, you know, is the developer a subcontract? Is the developer contracting with a builder or contractor to do something? So like as you increase the layers of um, the layers of middlemen, basically, sort of, well, so here's a cost case. gets more complicated. Asking if, sure. if, if this is what the city is flooded with, uh, partial business and you know, residential. So they'll have whatever three or four condo apartments above and a business below. Sure. They never want to rent those businesses out because they're taking basically a tax loss on that and living off the rents. So some of those have fallen fall into the foreclosure. So um, the question is if I want to invest in that business, there's a project, you've got four rentals in the business. Does any of the capital investors get into a business that might be a coffee shop? Or I, I think that I don't think you've been. I'm not entirely sure about the limits of what the capital can be used for, but I'm like 95% sure that it's like a that it's all to be used for like the development of the space. You can't use it for operating capital of a business in a space. But I do know that their first uh, their first project, their first affordable housing offering, affordable, which in San Francisco means $2,800 a month. Um, I'm not like making this up. It's a one million dollar project that's going to renovate two units and a bookstore. But I don't think that any of it goes toward the operations of the business itself. I think it only goes toward the actual space. The space renovation. Yeah, so like it's like past build out. And there are probably some blurry lines where build out actually ends. But you can't use the like buy inventory for your grocery stores. Can you speak to like a specific project that has been completed in DC using the fundraise model? Sure. Um, so they had a few. They, they've done a few, and I don't know exactly what they're called, but they're basically like they've done several, and they're they're sort of typically six figure, three hundred, four hundred thousand, whatever dollar projects. 
they're sort of like to renovate and build out a storefront or a apartment or something like that. You can check them out on the website. So sure. Like, sure. So I'm just trying to get a better sense of how much. So when you have like 300 people that go all in on like a property to try and rehab the building, for instance. How long do they maintain equity within the building? Does that equity is dissolve when the business opens, or like what is the structure? What, is, what happens after it's built? So there, there are different ways to set it up, and that's a question of how you set up the offering. So you can set it up however you want. Basically, you can say we're going to give you an equity share. We're going to basically have this function almost like a loan. You get like an interest based or you know rate of return on that. Um, for me, I'd like to think about a way to bundle a bunch of projects together because otherwise, like, we're not. Gonna, it doesn't make sense to say we're going to do an investment offering for five thousand dollars and then raise it from one investor. The idea would be to like say we're going to do like a fifteen unit scatter site thing that's going to cost like one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Typically, what I'd want to do is basically say invest at least a hundred bucks and you will get a return, whether it's somewhere in about five to ten percent, something like that, you know, and then you get that money back at the end of whatever term. Which is another question, what was the term? And the term would probably be, I don't know, typically like a couple of years. Typically we've done, I've done, I have a couple outstanding investments right now for 12 month loans, a couple for 18 months, and then like two that are like five and six and seven years. So. So then are there, so Kickstarter has like a bunch of stats. It talks about how many projects there have ever been. Um, how often they've been successful, yeah. how long it took. Sure. Like, are there similar statistics that look at the past um, fundraise projects? There are not because it's very new. So, um, how, when was it founded? Like last year. Okay. So, they started, I believe they started raising money last summer. And they've been moderately successful. But the thing that I think is interesting is that they have no presence in the Midwest and they have no presence in affordable, affordable housing development in inner cities. So it's sort of like this is new territory for them. It's new territory. It's not new territory for me, but so what, like, is, what is their like typical project? You would say mixed use development. In I think they probably do a lot of you know mid to higher density mixed use development. You know, it's really more a matter of supplementing financing from other sources. <laughs> so residential, commercial. A lot of it is accelerating gentrification. So if you've got a neighborhood that's that's transitioning, what they'll do is they'll be like, oh. If coffee shop owner, you want to open up a coffee shop there, and you want to like crowdfund it, then that's what they do. It's a Which lot is of that. Not what I want to do. <laughs> Correct. You want to do something a little more interesting, than that. but that's that's what it tends to get used for. And I, I should say real quick, and then uh, yeah, I should say that uh, oh yeah, like one of the things that's interesting to me is that um, a lot of people who are on Fundrise are very much like we're real estate developers, which means like. We're like white men in suits who write checks, which is very different from like what I think of as the process of actual neighborhood development, which is like small individual people. Like I talked to a guy the other day who was like, "Oh, like can you help me raise money? My wife and I rehab houses in Gary." And I said, "Well, how much money do you want?" He was like, oh, "Like probably like eight thousand dollars per house." I was like, "Wow!" Because if you had a commercial real estate developer doing this, they'd say like, "Oh, like we're getting a bargain at two hundred fifty thousand dollars per house." And these price points are totally different, and it's a question of social equitability and disparities and racial and social boundaries and all sorts of things. So that's why this is interesting, is that there just hasn't been. It, it hopefully will lower the barrier to people like the guy who wants to renovate a place for eight thousand dollars in places where it doesn't banks won't go because either it's a bad reputation or the return just isn't high enough. But not everyone cares about a super fat return. They just want to see that block stable, um, and so that's. That's that's kind of what caught my attention for the for this thing. Yes. So years ago, when I was young, I worked briefly as a uh, um, uh, hourly person for real estate research, which was uh, owned by a bank and had at one point been uh, an actual real estate company and uh, sort of a consultancy. And they um, they were at, one of their projects was urban infill. So the idea being to Use properties that were in in the city rather than to just have more small and, and costlier extension of services. So maybe I missed this because I was tweeting a little bit of your talk. But uh, um, do you have? Is it all we have of structures, or is there any um, uh, vacant lots adjacent to structures? Or you know, I mean, is this a path to improving the ratio? 
Well, right. So I should say I'm very interested in like high density. Um, I'm very interested in high density. I'm dense, interested in infill, like very, very close to my heart. You know, kind of an issue. Um, most of the stuff I've been working on is rehabbing, rehabbing um, like derelict structures, because uh, that's sort of like what I started doing. Uh, it's also way less capital intensive to do that than to build a brand new structure. Um, I will say I'm interested in doing a project in Gary right now that's basically going to be developing this aforementioned nine acres of land into sort of like mid density, like four to six plexes. Um, but it's a question of like, you know, I have this like private equity guy who's like, I may or may not come through with the millions of dollars that's going to put this together. And that's just like, it's a bigger project than I necessarily even can handle doing myself. So definitely interested in it um, for a lot of reasons, you know. But yeah, that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of like a longer term plan, mm -hmm. unless I can find the right partners to do it sooner. So. Uh, do we have a question? Someone back here has a question? Um, you, you answered it pretty okay. thoroughly. Um, I, I was interested in, so you explained the process of financing it really well. I was interested in um, how the space is determined. Are the people who are funding these projects also helping develop the ideas for what these spaces can become? Yeah. Or um, is it more democratic uh, across the entire neighborhood, including yeah. people that didn't um, give funds? Yeah, so I, I think um, a lot of people have said, like, well, can you even finance the whole renovation with people who just live on that one block? And the answer is no, because people don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to sort of use them more for their social capital and their input to the project. Mm -hmm. um, and use the use that as sort of like a point of leverage for bigger money from the outside. Um, when I got into urban development, I didn't really think so much about. I was like, what's wrong with us like hipsters riding our fixed gear bikes into these neighborhoods and then leaving? At the end of the day, it's like, well, there's a lot there's a lot wrong with it. And so the question is like, you really have to work within a community to figure out what the community wants and what the community needs, and you have to like have a much more critical conversation about how to do that, mm -hmm. um, which involves like community forums and outreach, uh, which is something that a lot of people don't want to do, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, this mistaken idea in urban development that if we give people affordable housing, they'll figure it all out. It's like, people don't want that. Like, they need that, obviously, but they, they yeah, it's a clear conversation, obviously. Um, how, do you, how do you actually get to the industrial property on your site? So you basically have to put together an offering, and the offering is a package of, it's a pretty monstrous package of like documents, and it's like a proposal that involves like a lot of information, <laughs> which is why it's, I mean, it's, it's a, you basically have to say, this is my private placement memorandum, we're basically going to say, this is our operating agreement, this is how the corporate structure is set up, this is the, the you know, capital stack, like this is the, it's like very, it's like way more complicated than, say, a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. Which is why I would sort of want to like figure out a way to bundle a couple projects together. And Gary, the funding doesn't streamline that at all. You still have to print the stuff out. They streamline yeah. it because the, the thing, the, the, there's like the estimated number of hours that it takes to complete like an SEA, SEC Regulation A filing is something like 640 hours or something. And so it's like we talked about doing this with a partnership I worked for, and they were like. We're gonna crowdfund this. I know you like those things like crowdfunding. I was like, well, what, what do you have in mind? And they're like, well, we're gonna pay lawyers like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then we're gonna get like one point two million out of it. And I was like, I think you missed the point. You know, like, sort of, uh, it's a lot of money to be paying to people who really have no investment in the project. Right. So they do streamline it, but it still requires legwork. So is are we gonna need to have a totally different? <coughs> Like legal vehicles to happen to make this really efficient because 600 hours is crazy. Right? Well, you, you don't have to put 600 hours into the ones with fundraise. Oh, I see. I'm that. saying the traditional SEC filings. Okay, okay. So they have simplified it. it yeah, it's simplified from the the actual filing process. Got it. Um, How difficult is it? I have not done it, so that is a great question. Um, I'm hoping to do it in the next like two or three months, but the problem is that like, you know, it involves a lot of questions that. I'm basically trying to work with them to figure out how to how I can do something that's going to be like substantial enough that it'll make sense. Um, so I imagine it's going to be more than a couple days of work, but 
that's the other thing is that like I think as we have these conversations like this one, we're going to figure out ways to make these systems work better as opposed to like this article I read in Forbes yesterday, which was like, oh, the Jobs Act is great because it allows accredited investors to invest multi-million dollars. And it's like, well, it's not really like helping us down here on planet Earth. It's like everything is about the whole idea of the, the crowd and the cloud. You know, it's like this whole like decentralizing, but also making things smaller by breaking them down into manageable parts. So uh, I'll be around. If, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. sorry, a really quick question. Sure. Any regulatory concerns, like with the investment side of it, with the SEC or anything like that? They had a, I think they had a pretty hard time getting it approved by the SEC, but then they did. Right now, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I don't know what the exact story was, but I know that it was kind of difficult to get it pushed through. And I, don't, yeah, I don't know exactly how. I know that's still an ongoing thing or not. Or I don't think it is, but they have copped a lot of criticism, or they did before, yeah. from orthodox investment people who are like, this is bizarre and lost <laughs> and vicious, and it's not going to work at all. But change is hard. Like, that's the so. best thing to hear. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so I have a question about kind of what you were saying, but <clears throat> there's a, a tension between affordability and fiduciary duty, right? And you know, I, I think this would be a wonderful idea if it could mean that you know, you know top neighborhood people could invest in their own neighborhood and improve the neighborhood. But that might mean that they're getting they're holding down the rents and they're getting lower returns. And so there's a there's a natural conflict between. And I'm just worried that you would have 300 investors, 150 of which wanted to get a higher return, and 150 of which might want to. You know, preserve affordability in the neighborhood, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you how do you navigate that? I, I think that there is a. I think that my whole interest is in figuring out a way that you can sort of say like we're going to give. I, I would love to be able to give a preferential rate of return to people who live within the target area, and then a lower rate of return to people who don't live in the target area. Mm -hmm. For the simple, you might find that's the exact opposite of what the market is, right? It, so you don't it's live quite possible. Area. But when I approached it, I had said like basically, okay, so there's a huge demand for affordable housing. But the way we think about it is, like in Gary, there was a historic rehab project, for example, that we had these um, historic apartments at a cost of like $345,000 per unit. And so they're like, well, these are affordable, so it's great. It's like, well, it's not affordable to the taxpayer. It's like the taxpayer is putting the bill, keeping these units affordable. That's not equitable to anyone. Um, so it, it, is, it is a balance. But I think the, the point is, is to figure out a way to, I think that you can make the cash flow work either way. Um, but because, do the investors sign on to one or the other? I mean, are the people who yeah, say, I'm giving up? There could be different I, types I, I of I want to keep the rents down. Or, I don't make money. I don't want to have good neighbors. Or yeah, I mean, like, you can do this. Are there other people saying, I want to be on the money side? I mean, how do they? I think you can say, I think you basically determine it at the point of the offering to say, like, we will offer a rate of return of X, and it's going to be fixed. So then when you end up doing, I mean, this is the other thing, is that, like, when you're talking about, Commercial real estate and all the the whole point of Fundrise, the, the, they state on their website is basically like the cutting out of many middlemen that drive up the cost by 10 to 20 percent for every project. And people will say, "I got this great project, I can write a check and then make 12 percent of my money," whereas in reality, they could be doubling that return theoretically without these additional layers involved. And so, it's sort of a matter of saying like. In affordable housing, you find the cash flow because there's a demand at that lowest segment of the market, like period. Um, and that's sort of a starting point to think about how to answer your question. I think you can find people who lend these lower rates. But it's just the point is that it's not blood money that's like basically like saying, we've done deals before where they're like, we demand a, a rate of return of like, you know, like 10% in like a month or something like that, you know? It was like, it's like, that's some questions for sustainability, you know? For social sustainability, I guess. I think you can do that on the tax side. Right? So if you have an investor that's pleasant to live in the neighborhood, wants 15%, but the guy that lives in the neighborhood will take 10. Mm -hmm. So on the tax side, if the tax rate is 10, so you just even it out at the end. So if you have a local investor who doesn't pay the capital gains tax or return tax, but the outside investor does, and that the returns are the same. Well, yeah, I mean, it would even out in that sense, but I guess in, in this... That's Sure. Sure, yeah, definitely. And I think that there, I think that we'll, we'll come into questions like that as we file the offering and say, like, what, you know... We can get a lot of Sure. Sure. All right, well... Oh! Cool, thank you so Thanks much. much. If you keep watching.